Uh, hello everyone, uh, welcome to Secura webinar. My name is Yulia Plivaka, I'm an account manager for certification services at Secura and I will be a host for this webinar. Today we'll cover topic of common criteria certification for software and embedded products. And I would like to introduce our speakers for today. First, it's uh, Anna Prudnikova, our senior security certification specialist at Secura and uh, Razvan Venter, our group manager product manufacturers. Uh, this presentation will be followed with a Q&A session, so feel free to uh, send your questions in the comments and we will address them at the end of the presentation. And uh, Anna, you're welcome to start the presentation. Great. Uh, well, thank you, Julia. Uh, thank you for your introduction. And uh, let's look at today's agenda. So first of all, we will start with a common criteria crash course. Uh, then we are going to move uh, to what to expect for an embedded and software product evaluation. After that, we are going to follow up with some preparation hints for the developers. Then I'm going to transfer the floor to Razvan, and then he's going to speak to you about the market value, international recognition, and the European Common Criteria Scheme. And as Yuri already mentioned, we are going to have Q&A session in the end. So uh, let's start from the... Uh, so what is common criteria? I think a lot of you already heard about the common criteria, but what actually it stands for? So the full name is the common criteria for information technology security evaluation, but it's normally referred to as common criteria or CC. And it's actually just an international standard for computer security evaluation for different types of IT products. Version 3.1, revision 5. Uh, so, document-wise, uh, common criteria consist of three main parts. So, part one is uh, introduction and general model, uh, part two is security functional components, and part three is security assurance component. And on top of that, uh, the common criteria also has a separate document, uh, which is not officially the part of common criteria, but always used in combination, which is called Common Methodology for Information Technology Security Evaluation, or so-called SEED. So uh, what type of products you can actually certify based on common criteria? Well, generally speaking, there are three main types of IT commonly certified products based on common criteria. So first of all, uh, those are general types of IT products, and that's actually our focus for today. Uh, those could be software or embedded products. Then on top of that, uh, you can also certify the smart cards and similar devices. And in the end, you can also certify the specific hardware devices with so-called security boxes. So uh, let's take a look at the important terminology, because when you're uh, in the world of common criteria, you will always hear those words like TOL, PP, ST, and uh, it's important to understand what it actually stands for. So first of all, uh, let's talk about the target of evaluation, or so-called TOR. What it actually it is? Well, it's a set of software, firmware, or hardware uh, product, which is actually accompanied by uh, the guidance that is evaluated based on CC requirements. And it actually represents the evaluated IT products or its parts. Um, so basically, whenever you want to certify something, this is called TOR. Uh, then let's move to a protection profile. Uh, well, protection profile is actually a document which contains an implementation independent statement of security needs for a specific tool type in form of requirements. So if you think about it, uh, for example, if you want to certify the firewall, uh, the description of um, generic types of firewall will be presented in a protection profile. And then um, if we move to a security target, and we are going to speak about it uh, also later quite a lot, uh, because it's a really important document, and it contains implementation dependent statement of security needs for a specific identified tool in form of requirements. Uh, and if you think about, again, firewalls, so uh, if you look at the protection profile, it will um, have the description of all types of firewalls and some security features that, gen generally speaking, uh, security, the firewall should have, but the security target will describe the specific one that you want to certify, the specific model. And actually, uh, also, the security target can always claim conformance to a particular protection profile uh, for a specific type of tool. Uh, so let's take a look about uh, on the certification scheme. So uh, generally speaking, the products can be evaluated by competent and independent licensed laboratories only. And Secura is one of those laboratories. 
So, and the certificate for the certified IT products, uh, they can be issued by a number of different certificate authorizing schemes. And actually different countries have their own certification schemes. And if we speak about the Netherlands, uh, in the Netherlands, the, the, the scheme is called NSKIP, uh, which stands for Netherlands Scheme for Certification in the Area of IT Security. Uh, there are two main actors involved in NSKIP. Uh, so one of them is uh, the Netherlands National Communication Security and Agency, uh, NLN CSA, and another one is Tufla Island. And if you look at them separately, uh, Tufla Island is actually responsible for issuing uh, the certificates, and uh, NLN CSA uh, is responsible uh, for overseeing the whole evaluation procedures. Uh, so, what is actually the main benefit of common criteria and why is it so uh, known in the world of uh, certification? Well, the main, uh, the main benefit there, of course, is a mutual recognition of issued certificates. And actually, the common criteria is a, basic, uh, is a basis for an international agreement, which is called Common Criteria uh, Recognition Arrangement, or CCRA. Uh, so there are multiple countries who signed this agreement and uh, the recognition of issued certificates by all the uh, signatories of the CCRA is up to level two for general type of IT products. And this is uh, the focus for today. But also, if, uh, as we already discussed, there are different type of products. And if we speak about smart cards and the hardware devices with security boxes, in this case, the recognition is up to level four. But it's important to remember for now that uh, International recognition for general type of IT products based on CCRA is up to level two. And if we speak about different countries who are members of CCRA, uh, there are 17 countries who are so-called authorizing countries. So those are the countries that actually are allowed to issue certificates and the Netherlands is one of them. And there are also 14 consuming countries. So those countries, they don't issue certificates, but they also recognize them because they're also the signatories of CCRA. Uh, another actor, uh, which is actually based more like a European level of recognition, uh, it's called SOGAIS, uh, which stands for Senior Official Group Information System Security. So there is another agreement, which is called SOGAIS Agreement, which was created as a response to the European uh, Council decision in the field of security of information system to harmonize evaluation requirements in the European Union. And uh, based on the SOGAIS agreement, actually the recognition is up to level four for all types of products. So here we already see the difference uh, for CC array, which is international and not only European, it's up to level two uh, for general type of products and for and only specific, for the specific one up to level four. But in Europe, based on the SOGAIS agreement, it's up to level four. And uh, there are 17 uh, countries uh, who signed this agreement, uh, all of them European, and uh, seven of those countries are authorizing countries uh, who actually issue certificates and actually also include the Netherlands and 10 countries who are consuming. So uh, let's move to the topic of what to expect for an embedded and software product evaluation. So let's start uh, with common criteria requirements. Uh, generally speaking, there are two types of requirements uh, which are presented in common criteria. First of all, those are security functional requirements, and those are presented in uh, common criteria part two, security functional components. And those actually represent the functionality of the product. And uh, the second type of uh, requirements is security assurance requirements, and those are presented in CC part three, security assurance components. And those actually represent the evaluation activities. So if we think about it, uh, when you want to certify a product, uh, you um, identify the security features that you want to certify, and then you put them in a form of security functional requirements. And security assurance requirements, in this case, represent the activities that an evaluation laboratory has to do to make sure that those functional requirements are actually in place. Uh, so basically, every IT product which is aimed at certification according to CC requirements should claim a set of requirements that they comply with. And we already mentioned there are two types of them. And those requirements should be represented in the form of a document which is called a security target. And actually, the creating of a security target is a really important process uh, in obtaining the certification of the product because all the following evaluation activities are based on it. Uh, and if we uh, think of the process of evaluation the product, there are actually two main parts. So first of, uh, first of all, you need to evaluate the security target. 
and only after that you need to evaluate the security of the product. And uh, the creation of this security target is actually the, the responsibility of the sponsoring party who would like to certify the product. And in this case, it might be either the developer of the product or a third party who would like to certify the product. So, but it might happen uh, that the sponsor of the evaluation does not have the necessary expert expertise or experience to create a security target. In this case, it is really highly recommended to use the support of the consultant from evaluation laboratories to create a security target. Because in this case, it will allow you uh, to have an additional assurance that the certification process will run smoothly. Uh, so just uh, to have a bit of understanding what security target is, uh, let's look at the contents. So first of all, a security target should include the product overview. So this is just a general description of the product. Then another really important topic that should be covered in security target is a security problem definition. And it includes multiple topics. Uh, first of all, it includes the description of the threats that the product should address, then the security policies that it should follow, then assumptions about the product environment to ensure the proper functioning of the product. And then in the end, it also should cover the security objective that should be satisfied by the product. Then, as was already mentioned, there are two types of requirements. They also should be reflected in, uh, in a security target and those are functional and assurance requirements. And in the end, uh, the security target should include the whole summary of security function of the product that you want to certify. So we've been speaking a lot about the uh, functional and assurance requirement, but how to choose so? So let's start from the fact that uh, common criteria already offers a set of well understood security functional requirement uh, in its part two. And those requirements uh, can be used to create actually a trusted product uh, which reflect the need of the market. Uh, this security functional requirement are presented as the current state of the art uh, in requirement specification and evaluation. Of course, sometimes there could be a situation in which uh, the security functional requirements are not presented uh, in common criteria part two, but that's a bit of a different topic. In this case, you also can introduce your own so-called extended components or like extended requirements in this case. Uh, so generally speaking, security functional requirements actually represent the function of the tool that support the IT security and their behavior can generally be observed. Uh, so to understand how to choose the security assurance requirements, let's first take a look at the concept of assurance. So uh, what is assurance? Assurance is actually a property of the TOR, which gives the confidence that the claimed security measures of the TOR are effective and are implemented correctly. So uh, let's say great evaluation effort uh, from the perspective of the scope, of depth, of the rigor, the greater assurance you have, that actually the claim security measures of the TOR are in place. Uh, so in common criteria, uh, the coverage and the depth of the evaluation activities increase with the higher selective evaluation uh, assurance level. So the whole concept of uh, evaluation assurance level uh, is created to help you to choose which assurance activities to put into place also to include into set. So in this case, uh, evaluation assurance level is so-called package of requirement. And uh, actually, uh, if we uh, take a look at the levels, they increase uh, with from one to seven. So this means that uh, an uh, evaluation level uh, one will have the lowest associated volume and depth of evaluation activities. So there are seven uh, levels, as I mentioned. Uh, so level one is functionally tested, level two is structurally tested, level three is methodologically tested and checked, and level four is methodologically designed, tested and reviewed. I'm not going to go into more details on that because normally when we speak about the evaluation of uh, software or embedded products, we normally speak about evaluation levels one to four, and I'm going to speak about it slightly later as well. And if we take a look at some examples, timelines of evaluation, uh, for level one, it normally sums in around two, three months. For level two, it's around three, four months. For level three, those, this is around four, six months. And level four is six, ten months. Uh, 
Uh, and because the focus of uh, today's webinar is actually uh, the evaluation of software and embedded pro uh, products, we need to understand what actually is the difference between the software and embedded products. And example of a software product might include, for example, secure erasure product, antivirus, or even a operating system. Uh, example of uh, embedded product, uh, which can be evaluated under the common criteria, include smart consumer products such as cameras, smart lines, home appliances, but also it could be some industrial component and system or even medical devices. So uh, what is the difference in this case uh, when you want to evaluate the embedded and software product? Well, the answer is the difference is not that big because the main difference which could be expected in the evaluation process deals with the scope of the testing. So when an embedded product represents the tool, the selection of the relevant test to include in the test plan will focus on possible vulnerabilities applicable to this type of products. And of course, we can imagine that the vulnerability is applicable to uh, an embedded product and the vulnerabilities that are applicable for software product are slightly different in this case. And uh, in general case, the effort associated with the evaluation on an embedded device uh, should not deviate too much from the one considered for a software product. But however, it also depends on the several factors. So on one hand, uh, the effort is strongly linked with the scope and complexity of the talk. So let's say more external interfaces, more offered security functionalities, or simply more components of the tour in scope will translate into more time needed for the architectural review and vulnerability assessment. Uh, at the same time, the other classes of evaluation, for example, evaluation of security target or evaluation of the guidance, will not be strongly impacted by the scope difference of the type of the tour considered. And we can also imagine that in most cases, of course, the embedded product will be slightly more complicated because it will include both hardware and software part parts. Meanwhile, the software product will only include the software part. But it also could be the case that the software product could be way more complicated than an embedded one. So the selection of relevant tests to include in the test plan will focus on possible vulnerabilities applicable to this type of products. So when we speak about the software product, what type of uh, tests can we expect? So for example, we can try to do brute force attacks on authentication. We can try to perform some injection attacks. So for example, SQL injection. If we speak about uh, something specific for the web, it will be uh, cross-site scripting attacks. It also could be some network attacks such as denial of service attacks. Uh, if we speak about the scope of testing for embedded products, of course, it's slightly different. Well, actually, it's more different, let's say. And in this case, uh, the testing includes fuzzing, side channel analysis, security of communication protocols such as Bluetooth, Wi Fi, TLS, etc. And also, this the analysis of security of exposed ports. But of course, there also could be cases uh, that some attacks, such as malicious software updates or security of data in transmit and rest, or like any network attack such as denial of service attack can be implemented for both software and hardware products because we understand that basically embedded product include both parts, again, hardware and a software part. So now let's move to some preparation hints for the developer and we will first start from the hints for people who never actually uh, undergone the common criteria evaluation before. So the question is where to start? Well, first of all, as we already mentioned, you need to choose the evaluation assurance level. Then the second important thing to decide whether you want to create security target yourself or hire a consultancy. And in the end, you also make sure that you have the required documentation. And now we are going to discuss on all of those three topics uh, one by one. So how to choose evaluation assurance level? So we remember there are seven different levels, but for uh, normally for embedded and software products, we will recommend to go for level one, uh, two, three, or four. And the question of choosing the evaluation assurance level is very important because it impacts not only the timeline and effort of the evaluation, but of course also the final obtained certificate. In general, it is important as a developer to consider what is the aim for applying CC evaluation. If the aim is to uh, obtain a general health check of the product based on responsible uh, evaluation methodology, then level one uh, might be sufficient to satisfy this purpose. But if the aim is to match the certification of the direct competitors, 
Well, in this case, the goal could be to look for at least the level uh, of assurance which those competitors have in place. And finally, if the goal is to sell the product to partners with strict security standards, it could be some governmental use or main telecommunication operators, then it would be really advisable to look for an evaluation in the range of level three or four. So typically, as I already mentioned, for software or embedded product, level four evaluation should be sufficient to demonstrate efficiently the robustness of the implemented security features. High levels of the common criteria evaluation, for example, five, level five and higher, are normally used by high-risk products, including uh, smart cards or some military grade equipment or encryption devices and so on. And we can also uh, recommend uh, to consult with an evaluation laboratory because it always could help you with analyzing the security posture of your product and recommend you a particular level for evaluation. Um, so we already mentioned that security target is really important document because the whole evaluation uh, is further based on it. Uh, and if you basically fail the evaluation of security target, the whole evaluation is already failed. So the best way to create a security target is actually to start with identifying the type of the product that needs to be certified. So uh, for example, it could be some kind of a mm, software product, which is an antivirus, for example. And then based on the identified type of the product, it is possible to identify if there exists a certified protection profile that can be considered as a basis for the draft of security target or also there could be a security target of a similar product that could be used for inspiration. And uh, uh, also about the required input from the developer. So first of all, the developer uh, or sponsor needs to make available the product for testing, of course, and it should be fully installable in the environment which simulates the condition stated in the security target. So then, of course, the security target, as we already mentioned, really important. And on top of the product and security target, a set of documentation should be available. Uh, so to facilitate the validation pr uh, procedures, the developer should have certain documentation and processes in place. And the list of typically required documentation uh, you can see on the slide. So uh, let's briefly go through it. So first of all, it's important to have the architectural description of the tour. Then uh, it is important to have the guidance documentation. Uh, it includes user manuals and also administrator guidance. Then documentation which reflects on your development lifecycle and the, de the secure development procedures. Then uh, configuration management plans. Uh, then the documentation which actually outlines the secure delivery of the product, which could be a physical delivery or like just a sim uh, simple download when it's software. Then another important one uh, that uh, there should be already some testing result in place. So basically the developer should have the test plans in place and test results. And when I speak about the testing, I don't mean the penetration testing, but I do mean the functional testing. And uh, when we go to uh, from level four, you also need to make sure that the level, uh, the relevant source code of the TOR uh, should be available for the evaluation laboratory. And of course, again, the evaluation laboratory can support the sponsor in development the required documentation and establishing the correct procedures. And this can be performed as an additional service, not a part of the common criteria evaluation, but just a separate consultancy. And if you want to have uh, some further details on the contents of the required documentation, you can find it in the common uh, criteria evaluation methodology, which I previously mentioned. Uh, so before we previously mostly were discussing the hints that should be implemented by uh, the people who never did the common criteria evaluation before. But of course, for companies that have already uh, did the CC evaluation before, uh, we can also present some uh, improvements points. So first of all, what if you want to move from one evaluation level to another? Well, unfortunately, from the perspective of the effort for evaluation lab, it will not help to save the cost for you. But for the developer, it will allow to reuse most of the material before, such as documentation for the tour, also part of the security target. So let's take a look at the example when you want to move from uh, evaluation level three to evaluation level four. Uh, so most likely the biggest evaluation difference will be the need for a source code review. 
which means that the developer needs to make available the relevant source code for the tool. Uh, Besides that, uh, another important change comparing uh, with the level three um, for level four will be the extended vulnerability analysis activity, uh, which will be performed by the evaluation lab, uh, because uh, the aim will be to demonstrate that the TOR is resistant to attacks of a higher potential, which will be a moderate one for level four. Moreover, uh, it is also important to keep in mind that uh, when you have a family of similar products, so for example, uh, multiple network switches with uh, different uh, ports configuration, you can also certify them all within a single evaluation. And in the end, uh, the final certificate will contain information about all models in scope. Because in this case, uh, it will allow you to save on some extra costs on certifying every model one by one. And now I'm going to transfer the floor to Razon and he's going to speak to you about the market value and international recognition. Thank you very much, uh, Anna, for the, <clears throat> for the nice introduction um, and, uh, and background on common criteria. Indeed, let's spend the last part of this webinar um, highlighting the, um, the value behind a common criteria certificate and also see common criteria in the perspective of international and European harmonized certification. Well, first, let's start with the market value. Um, in the previous uh, slides, you probably noticed that the whole methodology of common criteria is quite well defined, quite strict, quite precise. So one of the questions that developers often ask um, um, themselves and also towards evaluation labs is what is the actual value of the result? What do we get out of this? Well, there are definitely some points that can be highlighted um, and to start maybe with the, the least commercial um, uh, highlight that would result out of a common criteria evaluation. Well, very often this leads to an improvement of the product itself. Either the product, maybe through um, the results of the pen testing, which probably, which possibly identified some vulnerabilities that were in the meantime um, able to be patched by the developer, but also by increasing the maturity of the documentation itself. So that's definitely something that increases the quality and the performance of the product itself as a result of the evaluation. Furthermore, there are some other aspects that could be uh, interesting um, or maybe even very interesting from a commercial, from a marketing point of view. A common criteria certificate is probably one of the best certifications that you can get as a developer of a software or an embedded product. And it will definitely contribute towards giving a bit of a marketing edge among the competition or among other companies who are developing products roughly in the same range. Furthermore, the topic of acceptance of certificates is something very interesting. And as Anna presented in, um, in the beginning part of this webinar, under common criteria, the resulting certificate will be directly recognized both among uh, some countries part of the European uh, Union uh, within the so-called SOGAES uh, recognition agreement, but also internationally as part of the CCRA. So you don't have to do this, uh, the certification over and over again in different countries, but with one certificate, you already get recognition in multiple countries, which is something quite nice from a perspective of selling your product internationally. Furthermore, if we move to the next slide, so far, we discussed about um, common criteria. There was also a bit of a zoom in on the Dutch scheme, the, the Enskip scheme of, um, of uh, certification. Now, let's spend a couple of minutes talking about the future of the common criteria scheme, especially in the perspective of the upcoming European Cybersecurity Act. Maybe some of you are already familiar with the concepts of the Cybersecurity Act. Um, this European um, uh, law, this European new regulation has been introduced starting with the, um, with, with the realization that at some point we have too many standards, maybe too many certification programs, and uh, that leads to possible fragmentation of, um, of uh, either um, uh, various standards that could be applicable for a software or for a product, but also in terms of the resulting certificate. For example, if you certify based on a standard or based on a scheme, what does that say concerning other potential candidates for certification? Or what does that say in a different country? Is that recognized or not? And all those things led to the uh, idea of implementing something harmonized across the whole European Union, which is the so-called European Cybersecurity Act. The main idea of the European Cybersecurity Act is that under this act, harmonized schemes will be drafted, developed and implemented. And once they are live, then the results of those um, certifications will be directly recognized across all the members of the European Union, which is definitely a big step forward compared with the current environment of certification that we have at this point in Europe. Um, we are already having the first candidates um, schemes under the Cybersecurity Act and luckily Common Criteria is the first scheme to be developed under the whole umbrella of the Cybersecurity Act. 
the efforts on that uh, on that part already started from last year, and we will talk a bit more about it in the next slides. At the same time, we have the cloud service provider scheme that is currently under development, and ENISA, the organization that is uh, governing the Cybersecurity Act, has already announced its plans to implement a scheme focused on 5G components, and furthermore, plans for an IoT consumer scheme and also an industrial um, uh, cons uh, industrial product certification scheme. So, as mentioned, the Common Criteria Scheme will be the first scheme to, to hit the lights under the umbrella of the European Cybersecurity Act. What does that mean from the perspective of the developers and also from the perspective of the whole certification environment? Well, the first draft of the Common Criteria Harmonized Scheme under the European Cybersecurity Act was published middle of last year, in July. It was drafted by a specialized ad hoc working group, and at that, at that point, that led to the opening of a uh, window for comments. Um, comments were provided by various stakeholders, including certification uh, organizations, uh, national cybersecurity associations, uh, evaluation labs, but also developers. And all those comments have been integrated um, currently by the writers of the Common Criteria Scheme. And th the scheme is, at this point, very close to be published as, uh, as an official final version. Once this, um, uh, once this scheme will be published, and the intention for that is uh, as soon as possible within 2021, then this scheme will automatically replace all the, action, all, all the other existing national um, common criteria initiatives. So we will not be able to talk anymore about the Dutch scheme, French scheme, Spanish scheme, and so on, but we will be only talking about the European common criteria scheme. The perspective of offering certifications uh, under this scheme will remain pretty much the same, but there's an important factor because of the fact that there will be no more national schemes. Therefore, the certificates will not be issued by a national entity, but by specialized and uh, specific designated CABs, conformity assessment bodies, which will be in the power of issuing a certificate. However, the work will still be uh, executed in large amount by recognized um, laboratories, which will work in cooperation with those CABs. If we go to the next slide, we can talk a bit about the mapping of the assurance levels from common criteria to the assurance levels of the European Cybersecurity Act. As you noticed in the previous part of the presentation, common criteria comes classically with seven assurance levels, going progressively in the amount of depth and also coverage of the evaluation from level one, EL1, all the way to EL7. Now, the European Cybersecurity Act, on the other hand, has only three levels of assurance, which are called basic, substantial, and high. And one of the rules under the European Cybersecurity Act is that all the candidate schemes need to adhere to those predefined three assurance levels. Therefore, um, a bit of a discussion and a bit of an effort has been spent into trying to map the seven assurance levels of common criteria towards the three assurance levels of the European Cybersecurity Act. And the conclusion was that the best way to map those levels is based on the, um, uh, on, on, the, on the actual penetration testing activities performed in common criteria. So that was already slightly tackled in the beginning of the presentation, and it's corresponding to the so-called AVA assurance class. If we go to the next slide. Now, um, as we noticed before, um, AVA is linked to penetration testing in common criteria, penetration testing and vulnerability analysis, either for public vulnerabilities or for independent vulnerability analysis on a product. And um, well, without the intention of going too much into details, the AVA class has five components, which go progressively in terms of the depth and the coverage of penetration testing. So therefore also correlated with more and more effort associated with the, with the testing. And based on those individual components of the AVA VAN class, then the, the, the mapping has been made between those five elements and the two and, and the three levels of the Cybersecurity Act. As we can see in this table, the first two components of AVA one, one and two, have been mapped to the substantial level of the Cybersecurity Act, and the last three levels, three, four, and five, have been mapped to high. One first uh, important remark is that there is no mapping towards the basic level of the Cybersecurity Act, which simply means that under the harmonized European Common Criteria Scheme, there will be no certificates issued with the level of basic, only levels, only certificates targeting the levels of substantial and high. Furthermore, if we try to map the AVA VAN levels to the EL levels, we can kind of make the correspondence that um, the classic Common Criteria levels, assurance levels EL 1, 2, and 3 will be mapped to the substantial level of assurance in the Cybersecurity Act, and furthermore, from level four, four onwards, we will go towards the high level of assurance in the Cybersecurity Act. 
Now, talking about the contents of, um, of the new harmonized scheme compared to the classic approach of common criteria, the good news um, for most of the involved stakeholders is that uh, there is a very big overlap because, of course, the same standard um, uh, of common criteria is used for the evaluations. And also from the perspective of the developers, that will mean that most of the current approach that is being followed in a common criteria evaluation will still remain in place under the new scheme. There is one important element that needs to be highlighted in terms of the differences from the classic approach towards the European Cybersecurity Act uh, approach. And this is linked to one of the requirements in the CSA um, uh, referring to, meant to, to monitoring and patch management. Under the Cybersecurity Act, this, this needs to be in place. And the new CC scheme took this into account. In the classic approach, a common criteria evaluation represented a snapshot of the evaluation on a product at a particular moment in time. So therefore, the certificate also mentioned the name of the product and the particular version of the product which was evaluated. Now, under the Cybersecurity Act, the EU CC scheme will take monitoring and patch management into account. How would that work? Manufacturers will um, submit the product initially for evaluation and part of the initial evaluation will be also the review of the patch management processes. So how do they plan to deploy patches? based on which they analyze vulnerabilities, based on which they release patches, and what is the process for that. The whole process will be certified. And furthermore, whenever there is the need for a patch, so for example, when a new vulnerability has been discovered, then that patch, depending on the criticality of the patch, of course, will need to be submitted to the conformity assessment um, uh, body and implicitly to the evaluation lab for a quick reassessment and for a quick validation. So this will need to be taken into account by developers uh, in comparison with the current approach of doing common criteria, which doesn't evaluate patches. Now, to summarize um, the presentation um, and also the last part of the presentation about the European um, uh, harmonized sub, uh, common criteria scheme, uh, from a developer point of view, um, there will be no big impact in fact, the only impact would be linked to patch management, but that is not expected to be something um, uh, of, of a big impact, something critical for developers. Furthermore, uh, from an evaluation point of view, it is expected that the evaluation uh, way would be pretty much the same, of course, with the, ex with the, with the exception of the new um, uh, class of patch management. However, as an extra benefit, of course, the, the resulting certificate will be directly recognized across the whole European Union, which is a, a big benefit for manufacturers, which are especially targeting not only a couple of countries in the European Union, but the whole, um, the whole Union. And that is a difference compared with the previous approach of the SOGAS recognition agreement. Furthermore, um, it's an interesting point because the harmonized scheme will eliminate differences between national schemes. We will not have national schemes anymore, but only one single scheme, so therefore, there will be um, uh, no more uh, incentive for some manufacturers to, for example, prefer one particular national schemes, uh, scheme against the other, because we will only be talking about one harmonized scheme, which on the other hand will be very interesting because uh, it will um, uh, lead to uh, some very interesting discussions on how to maintain all the schemes to the same level and how to ensure that all the caps will be working on the same level. But for that, we will just have to, to wait for the scheme to become live and, and, uh, and see how will that um, be working in the next upcoming years. And with that, we have reached the end of our slides. Um, both Anna and I, thank you very much for the attention. And uh, at this point, we are very happy to try to answer your questions. Thank you, Razvan. Yeah, thank you, Razvan and Anna, for your nice presentation. Now we will uh, answer a few of your questions. And uh, the first, the first question is uh, the following. Uh, is there a process to revoke previously gained security certification? Excuse me, could you please repeat the yeah. Is there a process to revoke previously gained security certification? Right. So uh, if I understand the question correctly, uh, maybe I can try to take this one, um, Anna. Um, the question is about if a certificate was already in place and then a, a particular manufacturer for any reason would like to revoke that certification and maybe change it with a new one. Um, uh, yes, that, 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 that is possible. Um, uh, there are well, probably the, the best process to do this would be to, uh, to contact uh, the, uh, the certification authority that issued a certificate, so the particular national scheme, um, explain to them the reasons um, behind the decision that the manufacturer wants to revoke the certification and in principle, I think based on this um, process, it should be possible. 
I think it's one of the things that will be taken on a case by case basis, but with good communication, I think it, this should be possible. Yeah, thank you. And uh, uh, the next question, which was touched a little bit already, but uh, is there a certification requirement regarding the ability to fix or update? Should I take it? Um, yeah. On? Yeah, because I think it's connected to the one that you were discussing before anyway, the, uh, the whole patch yes. management and vulnerability management. It is, uh, it is uh, indeed um, uh, a bit linked to that. Uh, currently, in the classic way of common criteria, uh, this is partly covered. There is one uh, assurance uh, class called um, ALC for lifecycle, and under ALC, there are some requirements that deal with the capacity of the developer to um, to uh, issue flaws that could come later on in the in the in the, in, in a product. So it's more from a product, more from a process point of view, and furthermore, in the new uh, harmonized EUCC scheme, this will also get the level of, um, of uh, evaluating the actual patch. So both the process of deploying the patch, together also with an evaluation of the patch itself, depending on its criticality. So currently, it is handled from a process point of view. In the future, it will also be handled from an actual testing point of view on the patch. Okay, thank you. And uh, the next question is, uh, would a SOC 2 certification provide the documentation required to the process parts of a CC evaluation? SOC 2? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not I'm sure I got, yeah, I'm also not sure if I got the question. Yulia, can you please repeat? Could you please repeat, uh, Yulia? Yeah, sure. Uh, would a SOC 2 certification provide the documentation required for the process parts of CC evaluation? Right. I, I, I think I understand now. I can try to start the answer, uh, and I maybe you can uh, fill in afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, in principle, there are two different um, um, ways of, of, of evaluating and, and of certifying. Um, um, SOC 2 all this refer more to the concept of uh, process assurance, indeed, uh, and now I think I understand fully the background of your question. Um, while on the other hand, common criteria is fully linked to a product. It also uh, contains, of course, the processes related to the development of the of the of the product, but it's fully linked on the product. So um, my answer would be that probably a bit, yes, if the processes that you plan to reuse are applied for the development of a particular product. But if the processes are used more for the internal usage of a system in an organization, which I think SOC2 is a bit more about, then um, in that point, from that point of view, uh, you would not be able to reuse those. But regarding the development of the product itself and the way to uh, to uh, to, uh, to build it and to, and to ship it, those would be uh, probably reusable. Yes. Yeah, that makes sense. And uh, we have a we'll answer the last question for today. Uh, currently, each national scheme had its own rules for accreditation of CC evaluators, and the criteria were quite different. Uh, and uh, what would the, what would be the criteria for harmonized EU scheme for individual uh, uh, who would like to become a CC evaluators? Right. Uh, if that's okay with you, and I can also start yeah. to, uh, to make an answer yeah, because I think it's linked to the last part of the, yes. of the presentation, the, the UCC um, uh, one. You're right, that's a very interesting um, uh, point because under the harmonized uh, scheme, there will be no more separate um, uh, national requirements for uh, operating a cab or an, or an uh, laboratory facility. Those are all harmonized. Part of them are coming from the European Cybersecurity Act itself because they are mandated by the Act. And in fact, what is done is that in the current draft of the common criteria of the EU common criteria scheme, there are already in place requirements for the accreditation of um, of, of cabs and uh, and evaluation facilities. Well, they are quite diverse, and we, we cannot explain all of them here. But in principle, cabs will have to be ISO 17065 accredited for the conformity assessment activities. Uh, laboratories will need to be ISO 17025 accredited for their testing activities, and there needs to be a uh, correlation between the cabs and the labs that work in combination with that particular cab. And uh, yeah, the, the hope is that those requirements are, are very clear, clearly drafted in the scheme to allow for a smooth um, uh, start of the whole process. Thank you, Rasmus. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Rasman and Anna, for uh, answering the questions. Uh, that will be it for today. And if you have any more questions left, feel free to uh, send a message to my colleagues and they'll be happy to answer you. 
And uh, just a quick announcement before we finish. Uh, uh, at the end of April, we'll have two more webinars uh, related to common criteria. On the 22nd and 29th of April, we'll have uh, two separate webinars on uh, specifically industrial and IoT uh, related uh, certification schemes. So uh, stay tuned for the updates uh, and we will open registrations for them uh, shortly. And uh, thank you everyone for joining today's webinar and uh, hope to see you next one. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye -bye. Thank you everyone. Bye bye.